Right. So, Richard, is space is space travel the killer app for fusion? Sorry, is space travel the killer app for fusion? Huh. Um, I think listening to a little bit of the last talk, rather than all of the sort of why do we need to get to Mars, why do we need to get mm. to Saturn, I think people are realizing that propulsion is a strategic advantage in space. Um, because if you can get to an opportunity quicker than somebody else, um, then, then that is why people are so interested in propulsion and exhaust speeds, on top of the fact that, you know, the massive amounts of fuel, if you look at sort of traditional combustion types of propulsion, um, and, and you've got that on one side, and also electric, electric propulsion, which we build at Pulsar already, mm. um, you have very fast exhaust speeds, but the mass of the propellant, um, if you're just looking at Xenon, mm -hmm. it doesn't give you the kick of combustion. So we do want something that is very powerful and has low, you know, smaller tanks. Mm -hmm. um, fusion is super spectacular and it, it you know, you know what it, it, it has entails on Earth and it does sort of get that eye roll. Um, but I don't think anymore. I think people are seeing the results at, you know, the, the with inertial confinement at NIF. Um, Tokamak, you know, coming up with, with ITER, um, the International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor, not ITAR. Mm -hmm. uh, and people are starting to realize that fusion, terrestrial, should we call it atmospheric fusion? <laughs> no, let's not call it atmospheric <laughs> fusion because that sounds like setting the world on fire. Well, it's, it's, um, it's really making huge progress. Mm -hmm. uh, and our understanding of, of electromagnetic confinement of plasma mm -hmm. um, is, is, is really maturing. We don't understand it. It's a, you're up against chaos there. And there's all sorts of hype with AI, which I use so carefully because you can't just sprinkle AI on something and say, well, now it works. But oh, there, I'm sorry. That's, a, that's at least half the business plans I read about. a lot of potential in machine learning analysis of plasma and electromagnetic confinement. Mm -hmm. But in short, um, nuclear fusion for energy is making enormous progress. And yet, it's very hard to do in the atmosphere. I mean, if you try and do a lot of the work we do at Pulsar is involving enormous vacuum chambers. Mm -hmm. And trying to achieve efficient fusion is trying to achieve that level where your input is at, at par with your, with your output, at level Q. Um, you've got so much going against you on the Earth. Uh, you've got to have these enormous vacuum chambers. And because we don't really understand that weather system that is a fusion plasma, our only real get out of jail card there is just size. I like the idea of plasmas as a, as a, as a weather system. It reminds me that actually quite a few uh, people in climate change I know got there from starting off in plasma physics and then really moved to, moved to something else. But they, they, well, they, they, are, they are of similar complexity. I think but, they like problems that are very, very um, hard to solve. <laughs> they do, yes. But you mentioned NIF. And I've had the pleasure of um, visiting NIF, and it came closer than anything else to giving me a sort of like scientific version of Stondahl syndrome. I mean, it is just an extraordinary facility, these warehouses full of vast lasers. It seems hard for me to imagine that that's something that scales to space. No, absolutely right. Um, inertial confinement is more of a military application anyway. Um, the, the, the biggest problem with uh, inertial confinement being laser fusion, um, if you try and crush a pellet, deuterium, the, the, the question of how you harness that and the, the neutron emission from it mm -hmm. is, an, uh, is, again, it's a terrestrial problem um, you've got if you're trying to achieve fusion for energy. Um, and, you know, inertial um, if, if we're looking at magnetic confinement confusion, uh, fusion, confusion, um, yeah. You've got the fusion confusion. You've got um. You've still got that challenge of how you harness the neutron emission. You've got to have um. You know, walls about a meter thick to slow your neutrons to capture the heat from the kinetic mm -hmm. energy. You need to have lithium six belts around that so you can turn your um, neutrons into because you bombard lithium six with tritium. You mm -hmm. get um. Uh, it, with neutrons you get tritium, uh, and then you want to be able to have to. You've got to maintain those walls as they start degrading from the neutrons, and then you've got to have a steam turbine around that. So these are really complicated. Um, uh, industrial pro project. So why is, it, why is it easier beyond the atmosphere? It's not. It's very difficult if you're <laughs> in the atmosphere. No, uh, beyond the atmosphere. Oh, right. Um, well, the scaling suddenly works in your favor. Because if I have a vacuum space, um, and I'm actually using, I'm actually trying to use the, the reaction of nuclear fusion for the 
just pro just exhaust speeds, mm -hmm. then I don't need to. Firstly, the fuel pairs that we're looking at for propulsion are different. So instead of using deuterium and tritium to produce neutrons, we're looking at helium three deuterium to produce protons, mm -hmm. which was actually considered quite seriously for um, a, an original study for ITER. But obviously, just the fact that you'd have to the cost of obtaining helium three. Um, and actually the cross-section of deuterium-3 and, and helium-3 is about 30% higher. So we went for DT and it makes sense as a fuel pair on Earth. And we know what to do with neutrons and we know what to do with heat. Um, and we can, we've done that with fission. Mm -hmm. um, but in space, if you, you don't want something producing a huge amount of neutrons because you're going to have to maintain it. And maintaining something in, in orbit is going to be a headache you don't want. Um, on top of that, you can't divert neutrons out the back of an engine because we can't, no matter how clever we can, or how brilliant AI is, you can't make a neutron do what, it, what you want it to do. Mm -hmm. Whereas um, uh, a proton is a charge. So, and also, I don't need a steam turbine. I don't need to have um, uh, you know, these enormous walls to try and sow neutrons. And um, so the scaling properties of the problem start working in your favor. Um, and also, you can go back. Well, I don't want to go on and. On. No, I, 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 I'm fascinated because I mean, I've heard we were talking about helium three briefly um, uh, on the moon. On the on the moon yesterday, um, and when it's applied to earthly um, fusion problems, it's normally in the form of finding a way of fusion that doesn't um, produce uh, doesn't produce neutrons. But I've never seen it as a sort of like that the protons are. It's but so you're basically talking about a particle accelerator that goes in one direction, uh, and a spacecraft that goes in the other direction. Mm, you're not so in with uh, iron thrusters. Obviously, you're using electrostatic or Hall mm. effect mm -hmm. to, to propel up these ions. But with it, you know, these things are burning at relatively low temperatures, and there's nothing to do. There's no nuclear reaction mm. in them, or at least there shouldn't be. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> if you if you're you're trying to use the um, that isotope created in your, in your, in your reaction, it's the kinetic energy from the particle. Mm -hmm. um, that is an, an, a nuclear reaction, and that gives you an entirely different potential that's way ahead. I mean, it, but you're still, you're, chick you're, you're chucking the protons out. That, uh, what, the reaction mass is what? The protons? Or? Well, so now you're talking, so the first question, taking it slightly back from the actual mechanics of the exhaust system of, mm -hmm. the, of a neutronic fusion reactor, um, which is really, um, Gray, shall we say, <laughs> <laughs> um, is can we do? Fu can we get the, the 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 conditions for fusion? And we can. We know mm -hmm. we can do. It. We can do it on Earth. Mm -hmm. So we can. Do, and you know, people talking about doing labs in space. It's actually a much simpler problem to actually achieve those conditions in orbit because you've got so many things going in your favor. Mm -hmm. What you do with that? So, firstly, would you choose anutronic helium three fusion for uh, a you know terrestrial power supply? No. Um, but for space, I can charge you huge amounts of money for helium-3, and you will lose money, but you will gain speed. Mm -hmm. And that is a strategic advantage I can give you, because if you can get there quicker than your competitor, who might be maybe a nation or a company, um, you, I can reduce weight, mission time, uh, therefore cost, and your whole delta-v starts going, you know, the, the, the you know, exhaust speeds in space is fungible with money. Mm -hmm. uh, so. I can charge you for your helium-3 where I couldn't do that on Earth. And why is this better than using um, fission reactors in space? There's fish, fission reactors in space are actually have a, a huge, a very interesting potential and a very realistic propulsion system. The problem is launching uh, fission. I mean, is, A, you've got a lot of regulatory issues there. Mm -hmm. It still wouldn't give you um, the potential you can get out of fusion energy. And look, it's irresistible to us because <laughs> if we can do fusion, check, we are going to do it in orbit. And the propellant that you can, you know. So the, just, you, you, it's, it's, um, it's analytically clear that if fusion, if, we, if people can do fusion on Earth, they will choose to do it in orbit? Yes, if we can't do fusion, forget it anyway. Right, know. yes, no, that, that, but, um, that, that, that we can And I just go carefully. Well, why would I want to do fusion in orbit when I can just stack up solar cells in perpetual sunlight? Uh, because if I can save you, oh, it's an exponential saving, so, uh, it really, you know, there are certain mission parameters. Are we, are we going to move to different, um, uh, you know, galaxies? Obviously not. We're not built, I don't think, to travel enormous distances in space. And, you know, that is just, maybe that's mm. the quantum world. Um, but relative 
sort of space around us up to, I think, about Alpha Centauri, which is about 4.2 light years away, there is potential hardware. We, we could send hardware, whether or not that'd mm -hmm. be the right thing or not. Maybe we're just, that's a sort of archaic thought. But if you actually want to send a piece of hardware, um, you do not want to have to launch with it an enormous propellant tank. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you want to get there very quickly, unless you're doing um, sort of gravity assist and things like that, mm -hmm. uh, the ultimate exhaust potential that we can give you without breaking some kind of clever scientific laws mm -hmm. is, um, is nuclear fusion. That's where I can sell uh, the fastest exhaust speed. And don't get me wrong, I didn't wake up and decide that I want to do fusion propulsion mm -hmm. no matter what. Uh, if, if, you know, the great thing about Pulsar is that we build engines today that we sell today. And therefore, we have to be disciplined to show that we can deliver on time, that we can test them properly. And we talk to the primes. And if the primes tell me that they don't want fusion energy in space, then I don't need the sucker to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, but they are interested in what that exhaust speed is. And the more achievements done on Earth, uh, the more realistic that propulsion application becomes in orbit. And we want to be the first company to, to demonstrate the advantage um, and the, the sort of the order of magnitude of you get. I mean, even conventional iron thrusters behave differently at 10 to the minus 5 and a vacuum to 10 to the minus 7. There's quite a big difference in how they behave. And it's very expensive to get vacuums to that, you know, you need cryogenic. And what is, what is the vacuum of space? I mean, it's up there to the decimals of 10 to the minus minus. But right. if, you've got, it can, if you've got ITER, the, the reactor, not the regulation, mm -hmm. uh, and you're trying to take a vacuum chamber the size of this hall down to 10 to the minus 8, the cost of that is absolutely enormous. And therefore, you've got to have break-even fusion to make that worth doing. And if you've got the vacuum anyway, um, as, as we learned yesterday, if you want vacuum in a hall this size, you just send up a you just send up a, a starship and open the doors. Exactly. Um, I, would it be possible to get the Slido questions up on the uh, the screen here? I'm, ah, there we are. Propellant engineer here. Achieving the tensile pressures required for fusion, millions of degrees C, is extremely energy intensive. How are you tackling this problem? Uh, how how long have you got? So we're trying to keep it short. Well, uh, that's, that's how long right, I've got in we've theory. Got, I'll give you slightly long. So very quickly, um, originally nuclear fusion reactors for electromagnetic confinement were, were linear, um, and uh, the only reason that we decided to make them uh, a torus is mm. because we didn't know what to do with the ends. There's quite a famous joke in fusion that you could tell how old a linear fusion reactor, like a magnetic mirror fusion reactor was, by counting the magnets at either end like a tree. Mm -hmm. Just count the magnets, study the age of it, because they right. kept on doubling up, doubling up, trying to keep those <laughs> particles in the center. So the Russians actually came along and connected the ends and called it a tokamak. And that showed great promise. Problem is, it, it gave you more problems, because ions like to, to corkscrew electromagnetic fields. And if you make a circle, those ions are going to jump to the outside, and that's bomb diffusion, mm -hmm. the physicist David got. So you have to then try and keep them in the middle. And you have, the, for every problem, every solution is a problem. Um, and, and vice versa. Yeah, <laughs> and, and, but for, for, for what you're seeing in, in Taurus and tokamaks and stellarators, uh, uh, um, stellarators <laughs> that is trying to fix that problem of plasma confinement. But if you go, if you're doing it in orbit, you can actually go back to your linear original shape because you don't care about the leak at the end mm -hmm. um, without giving too much of it. Uh, you, you, you actually, again, it, it actually suits you. Yes, uh, it's, a, it's so, a feature, not a bug, because you need something going out so there. So suddenly, again, that's a favorable <laughs> plasma um, behavior. In, in your, again, you don't have to deal with a lot of the sort of pushing all the plasma back into the middle again. It doesn't mean that you suddenly solved all the problems. It just gives you different problems to solve. But there's less people looking at it like that. And I can tell you, if you take very experienced nuclear fusion engineers and you go you readdress their mind to the problem of fusion in orbit, you'd be amazed how many mental barriers get broken down by um, how much actually is, is how the, the different parameters of the problem. And another question we have on Slido is, um, this is presumably only for use in space. You're, you're not going to be booed for Yeah, it's not terrestrial. Sort of you, you can't use it to, to <coughs> launch. So you still, you still need Elon to get you up there. Um, but as payloads get bigger, you know, 10 years ago doing fusion in space would have been, people just think, well, okay. But now you, you can. So, um, but I don't think you want to launch with a fusion reactor. You, you probably want to, uh, have your, have your mm. fusion engine there ready. Right. And good last question. Um, given all the challenges, what's the most promising breakthrough you could see on Earth that would help you with your vision of using this in space? Um, ITAR. ITAR. Um, if I think that ITAR, I know that 
you know, it's a, an enormous enormous reactor and it's got its problems but it's it's also the largest little star built by humanity and i think the young the, the younger generations will be inspired by it mm -hmm. and i think fission reactors you know not very interesting but if you actually see these this huge plasma under electromagnetic confinement in in something the size of of, of ITER, um it will really uh create an avalanche of interest into nuclear fusion as a general um it's a it's a it's a promise that not only gives you an energy source for humanity for as long as we're on Earth, but also the ability to leave our solar system. So it's a heck of a technology. Um, and I think the vision of the size of um, ITER will inspire a lot of people. So that would be what I want to see on Earth. Well, I think congratulations on being the only entrepreneur that we've had so far who has talked about, about Alpha Centauri. Oh, sorry about um, I that. Think, uh, <laughs> no, 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 no. I think that's absolutely great. We should have, we should make a note to ourselves. More Alpha Centauri at the next economy summit. But Richard, thanks very much Pleasure. indeed. Thank you. And